Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Tarso Ministry Worship Services. We're glad you're able to join us today. And at this time, we're going to start with our opening prayer. Heavenly Father, 
eternal God, creator of salvation and architect of all eternity. I come to you with humility and reference before your throne of grace, for your majesty covers the whole earth. Lord, I thank you for your wisdom, which transcends times and your love that penetrates the very depths of my soul. On this day of your holy Sabbath, we stand before you, your sons and daughters, consecrating our hearts to you and to the holiness of your will. We pray that today's message will be a blessing as you allow your spirit to teach us what we need to know. We ask for a special anointing to be granted to our pastor and for you to fill him with your spirit. Bless every heart on this line and lift up every soul. For all things are prayed and asked in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening song, we will hear at this time.
this time we'll have our scripture reading, which comes from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Before we read from the word of God, we're going to pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us such a commitment of honesty and confirmation that your word is true and faithful. It's a confirmation to us for our very souls to know that salvation is unto everyone who believes it. And we thank you for allowing us to take this time now to read. We ask for your spirit to give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And give us also, Lord, a special blessing where we can share your word with others. For we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 16 from Romans chapter 1 reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. May the Lord add a special blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. At this time, we will have our song of meditation titled, Use Me, Lord. Thy will Use me, Lord To do thy will As your instrument I pray Use me each and every Spread your love and truth through me. Use me, Lord, to do thy will.
in this world of darkness spread your love and the truth through me oh use me Lord to do thy will At this time, we'll hear from Pastor Shalom Clemens in the title of the message is The Nervous System and the Plan of Redemption. Pastor. Thank you very much. May God bless each of you all today as we study together. I'm going to make a quick change on my screen. There we go. All right. Before I show you some slides, I want to get a little closer and explain something to you. And so that's what we'll do. We'll start with a word of prayer, and then I want to share with you how all this came about. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this day. We know that the crowning act of creation was the human body. We're going to learn, Father, that when you formed man of the dust of the ground, man being mankind, that you put in our very physiology the plan of redemption. We ask that you be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. I worked at a ministry many years ago. It was a medical missionary training ministry, and I was asked to teach a class on physiology, okay? So my only goal in teaching this class was I did not want the class to be boring. That's, that's a good thing. Don't you think you don't want a boring class? And so I prayed about it, and I said, you know what? Why don't we try to find analogies in the Bible to the various things that we're teaching because I had to develop the course. And I began to do that. So when I looked at the skin, I realized the skin is on the outside. And what we show on the outside is our emotional responses. You can tell by a person's outside reaction, you can tell what's in their heart when they're mad, when they're happy, it just shows. So I started teaching about emotions spiritually when we talked about the skin. Then we move to the bones, and the bones are hard. They're structure. They give structure to your being. And I started thinking about, well, the law of God. It gives us order and structure, you know? And then we went to, of course, the nerves, and the nerves give electrical power. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And so we started talking about that. And I just moved on. The digestive system 
takes food and we know that God's word is food. Thy word was found and I did eat them, the Bible says. Uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So the class went well. The students learned. And I was very thankful to God for, you know, helping me to do this. And then God showed me something. I went to John 14, 6. You can go there if you want to. It says, Jesus is talking and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So who is the way? Jesus is the way. Well, then my journey took me to Psalm 77, 13. And that verse says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And it is very clear in the sanctuary that it shows the plan of redemption. The lamb was Jesus. Jesus was the door. Um, the blood was the blood that he spilled on Calvary. The table of showbread represents studying the Bible. The altar of incense represents prayer. The golden candelabra represents sharing your faith, witnessing, service. So you see the plan of redemption in the sanctuary. And he said, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. I am the way. You get it? I am the way. The way is in the sanctuary. So I said, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, we already knew the sanctuary presented the plan of redemption. Well, we sometimes go to church and we hear this song, at least we used to. They, they've changed the way we do church in these days, in, in more recent times. But some of you all might remember, and maybe it's still played at some churches, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. Let all the earth keep silence before him. I'm not going to keep the, sing the rest of it, but you all know what I'm saying. Okay. So that indicated that there was a time when the children of Israel got to the Canaan land. Now you need, the sanctuary was originally a tent. And I'm going to use a phrase uh, that has redundancy. I usually say it was a portable, movable, collapsible tent. A lot of those are, those, those some mean the same thing, but it just emphasizes it. But once, and why did they need a portable, movable, collapsible tent? Because they were traveling through the wilderness. Once they got to the Canaan land and set up their capital, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. So what you need to understand and what we need to understand is the plan of redemption in the sanctuary didn't change. It was just no longer portable. It was no longer movable. It was no longer collapsible. That's why Jesus was upset when they were selling uh, the money changers, when they were selling the gospel, meaning they were, we call it skyway robbery when we have to go to the airport and pay higher prices for an apple because they know we will buy it because it's just the only, we can't get out of the airport to go get that apple. Um, we call it highway robbery when the gas stations on the side of the uh, off the interstate are higher than you might buy something at Walmart. But, you know, you're not going to go off too far off the beaten path because you have to get to where you're going. So we call that highway robbery and skyway robbery. Well, they were they were doing this. But the people had to travel a long way in order to get their sacrifices. And they were required because Christ hadn't died yet. So they were required to do the annual sacrifices. Um, and so rather than having to bring your bullock and your turtle dove, the priest would gather these animals and they would jack up the price of these animals and then pad their pocket. And so it was a burden for the people to have to pay these high prices for things that they had to have in order to sacrifice for God. Jesus went into there and with a whip and drove out the money changers, okay? So that shows you that they were still sacrificing there in the outer court. So even though it was the temple, it was still, the plan of redemption was still taught. They still had the holy place and the most holy place in that temple, okay? We know that because even in history, um, as we went through our Daniel 11 study, and we're going through our Daniel 11 study, remember one of the kings uh, uh, went through, 
and he got upset because God struck him with sickness because he tried to go into the most holy place. Remember that when we were studying Daniel 11, 11, and that was during the time between Malachi and Matthew. Okay. So it was still in that part of the system. So what are we saying? Jesus is the way, the way is in the sanctuary, the portable one, and it was also in the temple. Well, what happened when the people of the temple were about to murder the God of the temple? What do we read in Matthew 23? Jesus said, your house. See, prior to that, he called it my father's house. But he said, your house is left unto you desolate, meaning my presence is no longer there. It's empty. I'm not there anymore. And so that temple lost the spirit of God. Soon after, God raised up the apostle Paul, and he let us know that your body, 1 Corinthians 3.16, is the temple. So let's back up. Jesus is the way. The way is in the sanctuary. That was portable. That did not change when it became a tent, a brick-and-mortar building. When that brick-and-mortar building, which was a symbol of their organizational structure, when it apostatized, okay, Paul came and told the people, you are the temple. So if the portable tent revealed the plan of redemption and the building temple revealed the plan of redemption, this is what the Lord gave me. Could it be that when he formed man of the dust of the ground, that God was actually putting lessons of physiology, I'm sorry, lessons of the plan of redemption in our physiology. So I will simply say this to you. I am convicted that that is true. But I didn't know that when I was simply using Bible analogies to teach the plan of redemption. OK, but as I studied the systems of the body, I began to see the parallels were amazing. And it was just too coincidental to have been by accident. OK, and we'll just look at the nervous system with that understanding. I just wanted to give you a little brief understanding of how this came about. It was by, so I thought, accident, but I have found that the plan of redemption was weaved into our very physiology. So when we teach at the Torso Holistic Biblical Wellness Institute Physiology, which we haven't actually uh, taught that yet, but when we teach it, we will teach it this way. We will show from the Bible the very connection to the plan of redemption. And it makes it exciting for the student. It keeps you spiritual and it helps you learn. All right. So I hope you enjoy this sermon from science at this time. What I will do is I will cue the slide back to where we need to be. And we'll, the rest of this will be just going through the slides and it's a simple message. I hope you enjoy it. the nervous system, and the plan of redemption. The nerves receive, use, and transmit power. Power comes from the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible. It says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Brothers and sisters, we can go to church. We can dress up all handsome and pretty. We can have offices in the church. We can be pastors and elders and bishops and so on and so forth. But if we have not personally submitted ourselves to God to, be, to, to accept his plan of redemption for our lives and receive the Holy Spirit, we will not have power. Now you need power because we serve, we, we, we fight against one who is stronger than we are. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and what? Power. So we need power because the enemy has power and by ourselves, we're weaker than the enemy. Therefore, we need the power of God. This emphasizes the Holy Spirit. Also, the gospel, the plan that God gave us to save us has power. My wife read Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You see, your nerves actually receive, use, and transmit electrical power. 
That's how we're able to do what we do, think what we think, eat what we eat. Every aspect of our being has something to do with that nervous energy, that nerve energy, that electrical power. It's like you have a battery that God gave, and when that battery runs out, we die. So our job, and this is a little health tip, our job is simply to live in such a way where we can preserve the battery power that God has given for our health. This is talking about spiritual power, but even in our health, we are preserving that life force. So we're not just going to smoke it away, drink it away, uh, eat it away. Amen. All right, let's move on. You have parts of your nerve called nerves called dendrites, okay? And the dendrites are the receptors. They're receiving the nerve energy from a previous uh it passed on from a previous nerve, okay? So we have to receive power. Notice what it says in John 1, 12, but as many as receive him. So how do we get that power? By receiving Jesus. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, this is very interesting because a lot of people teach us and a lot of church, a lot of people teach, a lot of churches teach that all we have to do is just give your heart to God. He does everything else. Um, no, what God does is he gives you power. You don't need power to be forgiven. That's an act of God, but you do need, you do need power to live a new life. So you see, when you come to Christ, it's not just to be forgiven. And a lot of churches just focus on the forgiveness. God wants you to be a different person. He wants you to have victory. He wants you to have power. The things that once bound you, the addictive things, it could be something you ate, something you smoked, something you drank, something you did that had an addictive power over you. God wants you to know that he's there to give you power when you receive him. And the nerves receiving, the dendrites receiving that power teach that wonderful lesson. Well, you have a cell body and it uses the power. That means that power has to not just be received. It's got to go deep within you and you've got to, you know, you have to have God in you. What is this? What, what does that verse say? Christ in you is the hope of glory. There's a little quartet song we used to sing. Something within me that holdeth the rain. Something within me that banishes pain. Something within me I cannot explain. All I know is that there's something within me. Ephesians 3, 16 and 20, it says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit. There's that spirit again in the inner man. You see, there's so much superficial. You can see it in politics a lot. There's so much superficial. Oh, I love you. I want to save our nation. I want to save our country. You know, uh, we can say things, but does it go on the inside? And just also in the church, people can look good on the outside. When Samuel was trying to choose a king, remember, he got Jesse. He knew it was Jesse's sons, one of Jesse's sons, but he chose the biggest ones first and the oldest ones first and the largest ones first. And it, it ended up being the younger one, David, out there taking care of sheep. But he had more of the spirit of God in the inner man. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. If you want to accomplish great things for God, great things even in your own character and overcoming, we have to have the power of God working in us, brothers and sisters. And that comes as we study God's word, as we pray, and as we serve him. We have to be obedient for this inner strength to happen. So how do we learn this from the nerves? The nerves receive it in the dendrites and carry it to the deep recesses of our soul. Amen. And then we've got to transmit that power. You're not just going to keep this power to yourself, brothers and sisters. Mark 16, 15, you see the axon transmit. So we go, the dendrites receive, the cell body uses, the axon transmit the power. Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Remember, the gospel was the power of God into salvation, Romans 1, 16. So we are to preach the gospel. Now, all of us aren't preachers per se, but all of us have this commission. 
That means all of us are to witness to others. And that's what it means. It doesn't mean that everything is an actual uh, 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 um, an actual sermon per se. Um, there's a little song that says, do you know, oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes. Do you know, oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes. Jesus calls upon you to spread the gospel news. So walk it and talk it a sermon in shoes. Some of y'all know that song. It has different verses. Walk it and talk it. Um, sing it and bring it. Uh, it has another one. But anyway, we have to share the gospel. Everywhere you go, you can share the gospel. Do you know you can share the gospel with a smile? There's somebody that, uh, and this is a true story. There's a man in Bermuda. He's dead now, but I, I've met him. I, I, should, I should say I waved at him. I didn't actually meet him. But there was a man in Bermuda. And they have this roundabout that they call. You know how we have these roundabouts that we go around? So Bermuda is 21 miles long and three miles wide. So almost everybody knows everybody in Bermuda, okay? Not technically, but you know a lot of people. And it's very thin, so you have some main thoroughfares. And so every morning, most people going to work would have to go around the roundabout to get to the big city. I forgot what the big city was. I forgot the name of it. And so this man who had spent his entire career as a bus driver and working for the bus, he recognized that a lot of people were going to work depressed. You would say, how could you be depressed on a beautiful island? Bermuda, as small as it is, has its own mental institution. A lot of people are mentally ill, brothers and sisters, and have checked in to that mental institution. There's so much uh, economic pressure and uh, pressure to be like the be better than everybody else and have the best, biggest house. You can't own a home in Bermuda that's not a million dollar house. And it's not a whole lot of anything uh, by our standards, but every house in Bermuda is a million dollar plus house, okay? And the way people make it, they they build apartments on, so they have some residual income. That's just how it is. And so it's just a lot of um, economic and social pressure there and a lot of depression. So anyway, when this man retired, he decided he was going to encourage people every day. So when they would come around the roundabout, he would say, God bless you. And he'd be blowing kisses to him and waving at him. His name was Barnes. It's made such an impact on the island. It's one of the first times in history, a few times in history, that a usually when you get a big bronze statue made after your remembrance, it's usually after you die. They made one for him before he died. And when he got sick, I was there on the island. The radio blew up all the talk show. Where's Barnes? Where's Barnes? Where's Barnes? They found out he was in the hospital. The people knew, found out when he was getting out of the hospital and the place where he stood, they had it piled full of gifts. He had made such an impact. All he did was said, God bless you. I love you. So brothers and sisters, when you teach and you preach, it doesn't always have to be a sermon. It could be smiling, telling somebody, God bless you, going out of your way, giving somebody a cup of water, doing because most people just walk past them. You see, so we've got to be a sermon in shoes. We got to we have to give this power. If it's in you, it can't stay there. You're going to give it. That's why the Bible says, let your light light is electricity, right? Let your light so shine. That means if you don't hold it back, it's going to do it automatically. You've got to, if you've got Christ in you, it's going to shine out. You can't help it. So that's why we need Christ within. There are two divisions of our nervous system. There's a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. So you've got the part in the middle and then the parts that go out. The central nervous system represents the power of God in heaven. The brain represents the father. The spinal cord represents the son. So that's God in heaven. We know the father is in heaven. Christ is in heaven. And you can see from the brain and the spinal cord, which comes down, Jesus had actually come down. And even if you study the last verse of John, it says Jesus is the ladder. Now we talk about that when we deal with the bones because your spinal cord I'm sorry, your vertebrae is like a ladder that goes down, but that's a different subject that we deal with at a different time. Okay, so the power of God in heaven. God is working for us in heaven. Even in the investigative judgment, Jesus is working for us and representing us. He's the only mediator between God and man. The Pope and his 
and the priests are not mediators, brothers and sisters. There's only one. And I heard a loud voice in saying, in heaven now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. In heaven, Satan was defeated. We need to understand that because he is defeated in heaven. He has no more power, no more jurisdiction in heaven. And from that holy and most holy place, brothers and sisters, heaven, that is, particularly the most holy place, God is orchestrating. Jesus, the Son of God, and the Father are orchestrating the plan of redemption. And we thank God. That's where prayers are being answered. When you pray, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, your prayer, the Bible says in Romans 8, gets taken by the Holy Spirit up to Jesus in heaven in a groaning that can't be uttered, in a language we can't speak, Okay. And then Jesus takes that prayer and presents it to the Father as though he was asking for what you need. Well, the Father's always going to answer Jesus' prayer, okay? So we just have to pray. We remember Psalm 84, 11, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So we have to be patient, but God does answer our prayer. So the power of God working for us and our salvation in heaven is represented by the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system represents the power of God on the earth. That's all the earth, the um, nerves that come off the spinal cord, okay? And uh, that go to your feet and your hands and everywhere in between. The peripheral nerves represent the work of the Holy Spirit. Though the Father and the Son are in heaven, they did not leave us without the source of power. The Holy Spirit is with us. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We have power present with us. It's the Holy Spirit, but we have to receive him, let him go deep within our hearts, Guess what? Even if you don't feel like you love God, even if you have problems loving people, Romans 5.5 5 says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. So when you have a hard time loving God, all you need is more of the Holy Ghost. When you have a hard time loving people, all you need is more of the Holy Ghost. Don't focus on, I've got to love them more. I got to love them more. I got to love them more. Focus on, Lord, please give me your Holy Spirit. The Spirit will put love in our hearts. First Thessalonians chapter one, verse five, for our gospel came not unto you in word only. See, a lot of people like to preach. They say, I'm just preaching the truth. You should accept it because it's the truth. It didn't come in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. You see, when, in order for a person to accept truth, it can't just be words. A, myst a mysterious event has to take place. They have to receive the Holy Spirit and say yes to the Lord when the Holy Spirit touches their hearts and impresses them with the power of the truth. And in as much, I'm sorry, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So the word, it's not word only. So yes, we share truth. Yes, we share the Bible, but we need God to give us the Holy Spirit. And we need to pray that when we share God's word, that the Holy Spirit will be uh, received into the heart of the sinner. All right. Neuropathy, which is a disease where you have pain in your peripheral nerves, it results when the nerves are deprived of blood. So you don't have any power without the blood of Christ. Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And so even as we're talking about power and victory over sin, can't happen without the blood of Jesus. Can't happen without his sacrifice. And that's why the cross should be ever before us. And when the cross is ever before us, we will have mercy on other people, brothers and sisters, because we will understand what Christ has done for us. 
It's when we forget about the cross that we become overbearing and legalistic and hard and um, strict. You know, that doesn't mean that we can be disobedient, but we can teach the truth and live the truth in love. It also says they overcame by the word of their testimony. So when we talk about this power, you have to have God's word. You're not going to have God's power without remembering what Christ did for you on the cross and also being obedient to his word. Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by, it says the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. So you can't have spiritual power without the Holy Spirit and that can't come without obedience to God's word. Now, nerves actually feed muscles. That's how we're able to move skeletal muscle. All the muscles I'm moving that you can see on my screen right now, I'm just using my hand. That is nerves stimulating muscles to contract and to release their contraction. Okay. Because muscles represent faith. Remember I told you that we had the bones represent the law of God. Skin represents our emotions. I didn't tell you about muscles. Muscles represent faith. We must exercise them, right? You exercise muscles and we must exercise faith. So that can't come. Muscles can't move unless they're stimulated by nerves. So it says because muscles represent faith, the stimulation of muscles by nerves represents the connection between faith, power, and victory. You can't have victory without power. You can't have power without faith. So the whole body works together, my brothers and sisters. First John 5, 4 says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. That you need power for that, right? And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So that links the skeletal muscle with nerves that stimulate them. And that is exactly what happens in the human body. The nerves stimulate the muscles. So it's the power of God in faith. That's what gives us victory. And fine, not finally, but let's look at some nerve cells. There's basically two types. You have neurons and you have glia, the cells of the nervous system. They're either neurons or glia. Neurons conduct nerve impulses. Remember, you have a nerve has a dendrite receiving power, a cell body using power and an axon that transmits power. This is a single neuron, okay? A single neuron, they, you're going to see that they bind together into groups, but this is a single nerve cell, and you see that is what a neuron looks like. We must receive, use, and transmit God's power in order for us to be successful in this life. You have this fatty coating, on the axon, which is the part that sends uh, the, 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 the signal out. And the axon, uh, that fat, in the Bible, in the plan of redemption, fat represents sinful humanity. And what God did with the fat is that the fat was burned. So fat can be a symbol of sin or sinful humanity, and it was burned which represents our selfishness is burned slowly out of us as we get closer and closer to Christ. The things that once held us under their power, they get burned out. Those temptations that were once so hard to resist, God burns them out. Um, uh, things that we thought we could never do and accomplish for God. He gives us power and victory and the selfishness that kept that from happening gets burned out of us. First Samuel 15, 22, and Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord thy God. So this burning out of the sinful practices rep is supposed to represent obedience. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So it says we must sympathize with others in order to transmit the gospel to them. So even what God wants to burn out of us is our selfishness. You know, it, it's easier to give somebody some money than to spend time with that person. And God wants us to understand 
Jesus gave a great valuable sacrifice in his own self on the tree, but he also came and spent time with us through his disciples. The breaks between the Schwann cells, you see those little breaks in between the Schwann cells represent the recharging of our spiritual strength in order to continue to minister to others. And so brothers and sisters, sometimes you need a break. Mark 6, 31 says, and he said unto them, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Some people think that if we rest, if we take a break, take a vacation, that something must be wrong with our spiritual walk, that that must be worldliness because you took a break, that you took a vacation. You can't serve the multitude unless you've been to the mountain. And that's our problem. We're trying to serve the multitude and we've not gotten strengthened in the mountain. So that's why we have personal devotion. And I'll say this, brothers and sisters, I don't think you'll have too many people on a broadcast say this. You should have personal devotion. If you can't have personal devotion, and the only time you could have personal devotion is the time that you're on our worship and wellness broadcast in the morning, I'm inviting you not to be on the broadcast. Catch a rerun while you're on your way to work or something of that nature and make sure you spend private time with God. Now, if you can spend time with God and we can also get together, then that's wonderful. But brothers and sisters, our broadcast should not substitute for your personal devotion. You've got to charge your battery. That's a daily operation. That's a daily work. Uh, but sometimes it, 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 it means that even as an individual working for the world, working for the Lord, you need to take a break. Camp meetings were kind of like that. Um, uh, but just taking a break, we need to do that. Friend. So let's, let's let the alert, let the nerve teach you that there's breaks in between these Schwann cells as impulses get taken from one place to another. There's breaks teaching us that. Sensory neurons take impulses to the brain and spinal cord. Okay. So they go from the outside in their sensory. Now you have five senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, sensory neurons, take those messages to the brain, spinal cord. That represents prayer because we are to be constantly communing with God. Amen. Uh, the Bible says God answers prayers that are according to his will. The Bible says God answers prayers that are according to his name and his name represents his character. So when you pray in such a way where you want to have more of Christ's character and you want to be in harmony with his will, God answers those prayers. There's a little song, first John in first John. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, he heareth us if we ask anything according to his will. I'm not going to sing the rest of it, but we've got to ask in accordance with his will. He will always answer our prayers. Motor neurons take impulses from the brain and spinal cord back to the nerves, even to the peripheral nerves. That represents God answering your prayer and sending what you ask for and giving you the power that you're requesting. You have interneurons that transmit impulses from sensory to motor neurons. This represents Christ's intercession. So you have uh, uh, sensory and motor, but then you have inter that go in between the sensory and the motor. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth, to make intercession for us. So we must remember all of our salvation is only possible because of Christ. And the interneurons teach us that. Glial cells are cells that hold neurons together and support them. They are like the glue that holds the nerves together. Brothers and sisters, this is like personal ministry. You are a piece of glue 
And we're all part of that glue. We're supposed to hold each other together. We're supposed to reach out to each other. As we pray and seek God, God will show you, hey, give this person a call or uh, uh, check on this person, you see? And that's what God wants. It says in John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. How do we prove our discipleship? Not because of all the truth we know, but because we love one another. We are to come close to one another and show that love. And the glial cells hold the nerves together. Axons are actually bundled together. This also represents unity in God's church. So that means there are several nerves kind of bound together in an axon. God wants us to have unity, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Brothers and sisters, we can be all together and there's one person that's causing trouble, gossiping and complaining, and it can mess up the whole operation. God wants us to be unified. How are we unified? The word of God. See, some people believe in a unity that is not biblical. God doesn't want you to be unified just by way of your location. He wants you to be unified based on the word of God. So the Catholic Church came up with a unity plan that is not based on truth, but is just based on affiliation. God's unity plan is always based on truth and because, and think about all of us, some of you are Caucasian, some black, some Hispanic, some Asian, some might be wealthy, some very poor, some middle class. How is it with all of our differences, differences in culture, differences in values that we all come together? It's because of the word. We read the same thing. And that's what brought us together. So God's word is to be the unifier, not just some outward affiliation as the unifier. God's word is to be the foundation of our unity, that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so Jesus wants us to be unified. Now, I might have it in a future slide, and we're almost at a, at, at a close. But in that same chapter, it says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the truth is what Jesus said in verse 17 of this chapter. Then he says, why do we need truth? That they all may be one. So if we believe the truth, we don't have to worry about being in unity. It is the result of not following truth that has caused disunity in the church, brothers and sisters. And sometimes we point to the wrong thing to say, okay, this is how we are going to get it right. Everybody must go here or everybody must not go here. That's not going to bring unity. Where you go or where you don't go is not going to bring unity. Unity comes from the word of God and the word of God must be the foundation of our experience. So axons are bundled together to teach us that God does want us to be unified. And our last slide, if you look at Christ's death for us on Calvary and that whole experience, he actually was crowned with thorns as, a, as an effort to mock him. And did you know that there is a crown of thorn network of neurons that surrounds our brain. Remember how I told you all that when I was studying this, I was looking for analogies. This is a real thing. And they actually call it a crown of thorns in physiology. They call it a crown of thorns. Um, but it's a series of neurons that actually surround your brain. And so again, God reminds us on the highest level that it was the sacrifice of Christ that makes our salvation possible. So friends, let's give our hearts to God today. May the Lord bless you and keep you as we hear this song, Make Me Like You, Lord.
Amen. Let's have a word of prayer, brothers and sisters. Father, thank you very much for this message today. Simple message to let us know you want to give us power to be received, to be used, to be granted, to be shared with others. You want to remind us that we need the Holy Spirit and that we need God's word. And it is the word of God that helps to give us this power to unify us uh, and, and and help us to grow. Help us to always remember that on the highest level, we must remember the cross, the sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary to save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. If you know anybody in the Maryland area, send them the 2020 Ritchie Road, uh, Fortisville, Maryland. We'll just have a song to close out. And then we want to remind you that there is a free health class on tomorrow that is at 10 a.m. Same Zoom credentials. We're talking about osteoporosis on tomorrow. We'll close out with a song, Precious. <laughs> Not always pleasant. 
tough to get through the day. He knows what he's doing. He knows what is best for us. So let the Lord lead. That's just what he wants you to do. He's precious. He's so very precious. The master of wind and storm cares even for folk like me. He's precious. So very precious, the Lord of the universe is watching over me. The Lord of the universe is watching over me. The Lord of the universe is watching Happy Sabbath again. God bless you all until we meet again.